Hey everybody, this is So Heidi, and you're listening to the Successful Fashion Designer Podcast. We all know that the fashion industry is brutally competitive and it takes loads of hard work to get ahead. The problem is that everyone's secretive and tight lipped about their ways. After working as a designer and educator for over a decade, I wanted to help break down those barriers and bring you valuable knowledge from industry experts, and this show is exactly where you'll find that. Whether you're trying to break into the fashion world, make yourself more marketable, launch your own label, or become a successful freelancer, we'll help you get ahead in the cutthroat fashion industry. This is episode 56 of the Successful Fashion Designer Podcast, and today we have a mailbag episode. So these are questions that listeners either send in and uh, want me to answer on the show or just a plethora of the questions I get in my inbox all the time from you guys. They're great questions. I just don't always have the capacity to write a full-blown email answering your questions. And if I do that, you're the only person that gets to see the reply. So once a month here on the show, we do a mailbag episode where I pick the best questions from listeners and people out there, and I answer them on the show. Um, Today, we have questions on freelancing and fashion, things about figuring out your niche market, the logistics of working from home, and how how to find time if you work in a full-time job. How do you find time to get out there and find freelance work and to do the work? It is a tough balance. We're going to talk about how to do that today. We're also going to talk about working in the industry. What does it look like to get your first job? How do you actually go about doing that once you're out of school? Maybe if you've had a gap between graduating and getting your first job, how can you how can you go about getting your foot in the door finally? Um, we're going to talk about some skills brands expect when it comes to PLM software and Adobe Illustrator. And we're also going to talk about how to get into into the fashion industry if your professional work experience isn't in the fashion industry. How can you kind of come in at a sideways angle, which is, side note, exactly what I did. Uh, so if you guys have questions, you can always send them to podcast at soheidi.com, S-E-W-H-E-I-D-I.com. Again, if you have questions and you want them to be answered on the mailbag episode of the show, email me anytime at podcast at soheidi.com. I will take the best questions and answer them on the monthly show. To access any show notes for today's episode, visit sfdnetwork.com slash 56 or just scroll down on your phone wherever you're listening on iTunes and check out the links down there. All right, so let's dive into the questions. The first question we have today comes from Kayla, and Kayla has a question about freelancing and balancing a full-time job. Kayla says, I would love to freelance, but I'm finding it difficult to work 35 to 40 hours a week and promote myself as a freelance designer. How did you juggle working full-time and getting your business up and running? All right, Kayla, this is tough. Um, Side note, when I was juggling my full-time job, the business that I got up and running was actually my fashion brand. It wasn't my freelancing uh, business. I did do that after I after I quit my job, which I do not advise. I do not advise quitting your job and then trying to start freelancing. Um, I do advise you starting it on the side. And listen, is it hard? Yeah. Is it a juggle of time? Yeah. Is it a balance? Yeah. Here's the thing. You have to start kind of giving up on some things that 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 are taking up some of your extra time. So what does that mean for you? I don't know. Maybe that means the hour to a night you spend on Netflix or Hulu. Maybe that means the Saturday barbecue you go over to your friend's house for. What is that? What what do you do every week that is let's say 5 hours? Where could you find 5 hours of time to invest in building your freelance career. And I also want you to think about when you work best. So for some people, this is in the morning. Some people, this may mean getting up early before their day job and spending an hour and a half or two hours, three days a week in the morning working on their freelance business because that's when they're the most coherent, they have the most energy. Other designers, this does not work. They're exhausted in the morning, they just can't get going, they have a little bit more energy when they come home at night. Um, if, if neither of those is you, if the morning is hard because you don't like to wake up and if the evening is hard because you're just tired by the time you get home from work, then pick a Saturday or a Sunday and invest three to five hours a week. I really suggest minimum five in building your freelance career. And a piece of advice that someone gave to me once when it comes to 
blocking time to work on something that is above and beyond your day-to-day duties, your job, uh, whatever else that may be, is to put it in your calendar and treat it as a doctor's appointment. You might even label it on your calendar as a doctor's appointment and treat that time with the same respect you would treat a doctor's appointment. You don't miss it. You're not late. You don't schedule things over it. You take it very seriously. The time is blocked. You are going to show up. You are going to do that work. Um, So think about where you have the most energy and then block some time to get things done. I know it is really hard to juggle this, but the thing that I always tell people is that you have to find the time and if you want it badly enough, you will find the time. I also think it's really, really important to get small, quick wins. So what does this mean? If you're trying to find your first job freelancing and you want this big, perfect, fancy project from the exact company that you dream of working for and it's going to pay you all this money, that's going to be really, really hard to get. So instead of focusing on landing that big, perfect project first, focus on getting something really small, maybe not even in with the exact brand that you love, doing the design that you love. Maybe it's doing you know tech packs when you love designing. Don't focus on getting the perfect job first because that's going to be really, really hard. Focus on getting a job. Maybe it's doing a tech pack for a flat, small fee, one tech pack for a startup brand, whatever it is, get those small wins first because that's going to be the motivation that's going to keep you going. If you spend three months spending five hours every week working on your freelance business and you don't see any wins, it's really easy to get deflated and to totally give up. So I really suggest you start looking at teeny tiny baby steps and what does that look like for you. If you haven't checked out my ultimate guide to freelancing, I'll put the link in the show notes great place to start. Use all those tools and those resources to start finding some really small jobs that you can do on the side that won't overwhelm you and that aren't the perfect job, but just to get your feet wet. There's a learning curve and you're going to, you know, you're going to learn things as you go through your first projects. So just focus on getting the first project. Don't worry about it being perfect. Don't worry about making the most money. Just get something so that you have a success and that you have a win. All right. So Kayla, what I want you to do is block time on your calendar. I'm going to email you when this episode goes live, and I want you to reply to me and let me know how much time you've blocked, when you've blocked it, and and then follow up with me in a couple weeks and and let me know if you're adhering to that time and if you're finding the energy for that time. And if you're not, then maybe you need to look at a different time. If you did it in the morning and it's not working, then put it on the weekend. Um, But let me know how that goes. I would love to hear, hear back from you on this. All right. Our next question is also on freelancing, and this comes from Danny. Danny says, I'm trying to narrow my niche into athletic wear. How do you freelance for multiple alike brands without crossing the line of conflict of interest? Or do you suggest to only work for one brand at a time? For example, I probably wouldn't work for Lululemon, the dream, and for Nike, also the dream, at the same time. All right, Danny, here's what I think. I think you really need to look at the brands that you're that you you potentially can get projects with. And first of all, just try to get the projects that you can get. Um, because chances of landing multiple dream projects are pretty slim. I don't want to squash your dreams, but that's really hard. Um, so just focus on getting the projects first. Second, yeah, I would I would do a gut check. If you are designing for two brands and you're feeling like, boy, these are direct competitors, they are selling the same type of product at the same price point to the same end customer, then that is going to be a problem. And I just don't think it's going to fare very well if either of those clients finds out that you're designing for the other one. The industry is very small. Everybody talks. Word gets around. They will find out. That being said, I don't think you have to limit working for only one brand at a time time. There are so many brands out there and so many different parts of the niche when it comes to, let's say, athletic and activewear, as you've mentioned, you want to work in. There may be, you know, Lululemon has a certain price point. Um, Other brands, maybe startups or smaller independent brands have different price points. Athleta has a very different customer than Lulu does. You know, Lulu's customer is a little bit younger. Athleta's customer is a little bit more mom. Now, arguably, those could still be very much direct competitors, but you need to take a gut check when it comes to this. I don't think it means, and it definitely didn't in my um hasn't meant in my my industry experience in freelancing limiting myself to one brand i have worked for multiple brands in the same category but they are at different price points they're servicing different customers their product uh style and just overall aesthetic is is a little bit different they're complementary but not competitive so you know i talked to um 
uh, in my years, I've talked to a lot of, you know, sales reps and people in showrooms, and they stock product that is complementary but not competitive. And so you want to think about that when it comes to what kind of brands you're working for, complementary but not competitive. Because, yeah, if you're working in a niche, you're going to be doing a lot of activewear or whatever your niche is, denim. And so, again, it's just going to be a matter of who their exact target customer is, what the price point, and if there's any style and aesthetic variants. So again, it's a gut check. There's no blanket answer. Um, arguably, Nike and Lulu could have, you know, depending on what exact portion of their athletic category you're designing into, um, maybe you're doing more of the athletic wear for Nike. And for Lulu, you're doing a little bit more of the lifestyle product because Lulu has a lot of stuff that crosses over into lifestyle. Maybe it's running versus yoga. Um, so I think there's all sorts of different angles you can look at it and step back and think, if this customer found out I was designing for this other customer and I'm doing the exact type of same product, color block and printed leggings, for example, for the 25 to 35 year old woman at the $78 price point, that might be a problem. So think about it, do your gut check and and go forward with that. Again, it does not mean designing only for one brand at a time. I actually think that's a terrible idea because then all your eggs are in one basket. If you lose that brand, you're frantically trying to find another brand. I always suggest trying to diversify and having a couple clients. So if you lose one client, you've only learned lost a portion of your income. Um, But yeah, it doesn't mean limiting yourself. It also, it just means using your best morals and judgments and deciding what does my gut say about are these complimentary or are they really, really direct competitors? So I hope that helps, Danny. Let me know any other questions or if that helps you get a little bit more clear on who you can go after for freelancing in the athletic category. All right. The next question we have up is also on freelancing. This comes from PKP. PKP has started doing some freelance in the textile space. And she says, I have a doubt regarding freelancing in fashion. You had talked about the meeting the right people in your fashion portfolio guide. Since I am from India, and as far as surface pattern design is concerned, I have worked with print studios in the USA and also in Europe. I've not met any of them in person, but still managed to work with them. I found all these clients with the help of email pitches. I just give them the link to my portfolio website, and we go from there. Is it possible to do the same with fashion? Will companies I pitch to be willing to hire a freelance designer without a personal meeting? PKP, the short and quick answer is yes. The short and quick answer is also sometimes no. Um, Here's the thing that makes freelancing and fashion extra hard. Uh, It is possible. You can do it. um, But it does make it a little bit harder than other industries. A lot of brands, and this is starting to change as the culture the work culture changes and technology changes and things advance and people's mindsets about workplaces change. And we are going towards more of a gig and remote and freelance economy. Fashion is catching up, but it is slow. It is it is behind. And so there are a lot of brands, there are a lot of people out there who want you to work on site, who want you to be close to be able to do in-person meetings. There are also a lot of brands that don't require this. I have done more projects remote and more projects started out working with brands for two, three, four months before I even met them once. And then maybe we'd cross paths at a trade show or I would attend a sales meeting. Um, So yeah, it's absolutely possible to do the work remote. Is it a little bit harder to negotiate in our industry right now? Yeah, I think that it is. Um, But here's what you have to do. And this is what I suggest in the Ultimate Guide to Freelancing is to start out by negotiating a small trial project at a trial rate. Um, So if you don't remember this, refresh yourself in the book. But it basically goes like this. The brand is feeling a little bit concerned about working with someone remote. You know, they're they're just not sure if it's going to work, having them off-site, you know, communicating via Skype or FaceTime or wherever it may be. And so they're a little bit nervous. So for them, it's a big risk to invest in a big project or a high hourly rate with a freelancer off-site when maybe they've been burned before by a freelancer. Maybe a freelancer has flaked out on them and said they were going to deliver and then never delivered. You'd be surprised how many freelancers out there actually do that. They say they're going to do it and then they're three days late. And that puts a brand in a very uncomfortable position. We have deadlines to meet. We have goals. And and you getting stuff done as a freelancer has a domino effect on everything else that we need to do. So what you can 
can do is negotiate with them. And if there's any hesitation or reservation from their side about someone working remote and offsite and not having met in person, I think you can always first alleviate that by hopping on a Skype or a Zoom or a FaceTime, something more video to video. So you get to know them a little bit. They know who you are. They see your face. They feel a little more comfortable. Second, I would suggest going in with, hey, listen, I know if they have expressed concern or hesitation about working remote, find out why. And then depending on what their reason is, say, listen, I know the remote arrangement makes you a little bit nervous because ABC, XYZ, because, you know, you've had freelancers flake out on you before. Whatever they told you the reason was, approach that and say, listen, I know this is this is something that makes you a little bit uncomfortable because you've had freelancers flake out on you before. Let's do this. I'm going to do a small trial project for you. It's just going to take two or three hours and I'm going to do it at a reduced rate so that's really low risk for you. And I'm going to show you that I can do an exceptional job. I'm going to show you that I can over deliver. I will meet the deadline. I will make sure you get exactly what you need. I am a good worker and I can prove to you that I am not going to flake out or whatever their reservation or hesitation was for working remote. Um, If you can get them to agree to that, then you just do a stellar job. You kick major butt on that trial project and you show them that you are great and why it's comfortable and okay to work with you remote. Um, I have... I have done that with brands. I have I have known other freelancers that have done that with brands. And from there on after, most of the time, the, the brand agrees. You know what? Oh, wow, that was great. That was really easy. We've worked with freelancers before. You were such a different type of person to work with. Um, again, you have to deliver. If you say you're going to, you have to deliver. But that's a great strategy to sort of get over the uh, we really want someone in-house hurdle that a lot of brands do have. So try pitching that. But yes, you can absolutely work with brands without meeting them in person. Again, a lot of the brands I've worked with, I've never met in person or I haven't met until three, four, five, six months after we've been working together. We hop on Skype or Zoom or FaceTime and it's absolutely fine. This is the the beauty of the modern technology that we have today. So I hope that helps PKP. Let me know um, if you try that strategy. Let me know how it goes. I would love to hear some updates from you. All right, next we're going to dive into some discussion on industry jobs and working as an employee. So this first question comes from Nancy. And Nancy says, I studied fashion for four years and I have my bachelor's, but I graduated two years ago and I've been stuck. I'm scared I'll never be able to get myself out of this hole. I never want to give up on my dreams, but now at 23 with a cashier job, my dreams seem so far away. All I want to do is find a job in the fashion industry doing what I love to do, which is design. One day I plan on owning my own company, but where do I start? Should I go back to school, which is what I'm thinking? Honestly, I'm scared, stuck, and lost, and I just want to make my degree worth my time and money. All right, Nancy, my first advice is don't go back to school. I don't think you need to go back to school. I think a four-year degree is plenty. Um, My guess is you're probably still paying off some student loans, and I just would hate to see you take on any more. So I don't think going back to school is the right answer. I think you have a couple different ways to go about this. Um, I realize it's been two years since you've graduated, but I think there's still opportunity to break back into the industry. One, I don't know where you live, but one could be in the opportunity of an internship. If you didn't have any internships to start, then I think getting an internship and getting some experience under your belt is going to be a great starting point. Um, Two, I don't know if you have a portfolio, but I would really think about getting a portfolio of work together to show that you have the design aesthetic and the experience and illustrator and tech packs to do an assistant and entry-level job in the industry. If you're not sure what that should look like, check out my ultimate guide to creating your fashion portfolio. I will link to it in the show notes. There's a section in there specifically on what your portfolio should include for um, students, recent grads, and entry-level designers. And I would really focus on creating a body of work that aligns with that, specifically showing that you know how to sketch flats with accurate detail and construction in Adobe Illustrator, and you know how to spec a garment and put a tech pack together. So I would I would start with that so that you have something to present and to show when applying for jobs. Another alternative direction, which we're going to come back to again later in the episode with another question from a different designer, is focus on getting a job based on the company and not based on the job. So what does that mean? 
if you're just for some reason not feeling like you can break in into the design space as an assistant designer um, or somebody in the design department, then don't go after the actual job, but go after a company. So focus on getting a job at a fashion company. And what kind of job? Well, I don't know, whatever kind of job you feel like you're qualified for and you're ready to go after or is open. Um, So that may be an administrative assistant type of job. That may be uh, a receptionist type of job. I don't know what the options are, but I would encourage you to explore based on company instead of based on exact job. Because here's the thing, once you get your foot in the door at a company, it's a lot easier to get another opportunity within that company going from an administrative assistant in some random department and then breaking into the fashion department because you start to get to know people within the company. You start to create relationships. You can do some networking and you can work your way into the company within the brand that you already work at. So I know sometimes getting that first design role can be a really, really big hurdle to get over, but I encourage you to look at company versus job. And once you're in the company, you can work your way up and around to the right department, to the right position. So again, what type of portfolio do you have to present and show that you know how to sketch in Illustrator accurate, detailed CADs and do tech packs and spec works? Because at the end of the day, that is the ta- those are the tasks that entry level and recent grads are going to do. That is the ta- Those are the tasks that designers with no true industry experience coming straight out of school, that is what you do. So if you can showcase that, I think you should start applying to jobs. Um, Maybe it's, again, doing an internship, but I think getting your foot in the door into one of those companies to start Maybe it's only a part-time opportunity. Maybe it's an apprentice type of opportunity. Get something. Um, I think that'll give you some encouragement and some inspiration. I know you're working as a cashier right now, and that probably feels pretty frustrating. So I would really look at getting into a role within a company. Again, I don't know where you're at or what your portfolio looks like, but uh, think about all those things I've said. Check out the ultimate guide to portfolios, put a body of work together, and then apply based on company instead of exact job, title, or role. It's a lot easier to work your way up and around a company once you're in the door. All right, Nancy, I hope that helps. Let me know what you wind up putting together and how that goes. I would love to get some updates from you. Again, you guys, anytime you have questions or want me to answer anything you have to ask on the show, email me at podcast at Um, And all of you out there whose questions I'm answering, please do update me at podcast at soheidi.com. I love hearing from you. All right, next up, we have a question from Lavendor. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. It's like lavender, but O-R. So lavender, perhaps. Beautiful name. Her question is also on industry job experience. And she asks, could you speak to the importance of having knowledge of PLM centric and flex? So for those of you who don't know, PLM or PDM is product lifecycle management software or product development management software. And what this is, is this is software essentially that tracks the life cycle of a product in its development. So uh, where it is in the sampling process, all the trims and the parts that are needed to make it, um, comments. It's, it's like a really, depending on the system, it can be a really, really robust system that you build your tech pack in and then vendors make comments in there and you make comments in there and it's used as a tool to compile your tech pack and then also manage and track your entire product through the development and the life cycle. So uh, so to start over, Lavender says, could you speak to the importance of having working knowledge of PLM, Centric and Flex, as it has become critical when applying for assistant to senior level design positions? All right. Um, to be honest with you, Lavender, I don't know much about Centric or Flex. Um, I've used some PLM in my in my day, and here's kind of how I feel. If there's a job that's specifically asking for Centric and Flex, um, you know that could be a deal killer if you don't have that experience. I don't know how much those softwares cost. If you can download a 30 day trial and you can figure out how to use it on your own, you know you could use that as a as a uh, angle in your application in your interview to say, hey, listen, I have PLM experience in these other packages, in these other platforms. I don't have it in Centric, but I went ahead and checked it out. I spent a few weeks really digging in and trying to teach myself the software. I have the fundamentals figured out, and I know I could quickly grasp 
all the skills that you guys need within the team. I think that, first of all, shows a huge desire to learn and grow and and a very assertive employee. Um, As a hiring manager, I would be very impressed with someone who took the initiative on their own to try to learn something. Uh, before even applying to the job um, or in the job application process, say I'm working on learning it on my own, doing some self-directed learning. If it's not tangible because maybe it's really expensive, to be honest, I don't know about these platforms, um, then I think you know it could be a deal killer for that specific opportunity. I also think if you've used other PLM software, there is, you know, on some level, there's a lot of crossover amongst them. And so it might just be a matter of, you know, I, I haven't used Centric and Flex, but I've used these other softwares and I'm sure I could adapt quickly. I'm happy to take time outside of my day-to-day responsibilities and learn this on my own time. Again, show that you're self-directed and you're driven to learn. Um, if they're not requesting that and, and they're just requesting PLM in general, what I think you can do is check out some of the free uh, PLM platforms that exist out there. Um, there's multiple of them. Just Google it. Um, I'm not going to mention any specific names because, you know, there's a lot of startups out there that are creating PLM platforms for the fashion industry and they come and go, but there's a lot of ones out there that are free. So if you don't have any experience and you can't get it in any of the big name ones because they are expensive, then check out some of the free platforms poke around, learn your way around, see what it feels like to work within a PLM platform. And then when you go into apply for jobs, I think you can just come at it with the angle of, you know what, I've played around with this and this. I don't have any specific software experience in the software package you guys use, but I'm I'm sure I could get up to speed really quickly. And I'd be happy to take the initiative to do some learning outside of my regular job duties and, and the work day to make sure that I get up to speed quickly. So I often just think it's it's coming up with creative ways to show that maybe you don't have experience in this, but you took some proactive initiative to get experience in something else that is accessible, that has crossover knowledge, and that you're willing to learn. Again, for some brands, it could be a deal breaker. I think at the end of the day, it's so hard to have specific experience for what the brand wants in the exact PLM platform that they want because there are a lot of PLM platforms out there. Some brands even have their own custom ones built if the brand's big enough and they have the infrastructure and the team and the finances to do that. So I think it can be hard for a brand to require experience in a specific platform because there are so many different ones. Um, So if you could just show that you have some knowledge in one or two, again, those could be some of the free ones that are out there. Take the self direct initiative to learn those on your own and then tell them about that and I think that they'll be impressed and they'll see that you're proactive and you're out there make taking the initiative which again as a hiring manager that is a huge asset in an employee so I hope that helps Lavendor uh, let us know what you think about that and uh, if you uh, take any of that advice and use it to start applying for jobs I'd love to hear what results you get Thanks so much. Uh, Next up is from Rosella, also known as Rox, R-O-X. Rosella, so nice to see your name in my inbox as always. And Rosella asks, is it common to draw CADs without references like photos or a mannequin? For an interview, me and the other candidates had to draw a leather jacket from scratch, having only the jacket itself in front of us. Then we had to load a plaid pattern in a shirt with photoshop is it useful to know how to render textures also all right so first up drawing a garment from from a drawing a cad from an actual garment yes you have to know how to do this okay here's the thing a lot of times this is just how the fashion industry works guys Brands go out and they shop. Maybe they go to Europe or Tokyo. They go somewhere that's super fashionable. They buy the stuff that's ahead of the trends. And they bring bags full of samples back to the office. And guess what? A lot of the younger designers, a lot of the assistants, a lot of the entry level are drawing those up in Illustrator using an actual garment as reference. So you don't always have a photo. You don't always have a mannequin. You don't always always have this whatever, you know, sort of quote unquote perfect arrangement that works for you to draw flats. Um, Yes, you have to know how to draw it from a real garment. But here's the thing. Here's what I really, really suggest. You don't need to necessarily start from absolute scratch. All right. 
a lot of times when you're working with brands, they have a library of flats. So if they're working with jackets, they probably have a lot of jackets already drawn. And what happens is you wind up kind of Frankensteining it together. Um, you pull from their library of sketches. So you start with a flat uh, jacket body from theirs, and then you maybe just have to change some style lines and some details. And so often you aren't always starting from scratch. Now for an application or an interview process, maybe they had you start from scratch. And that is a skill that you should have. So if you have a physical garment, well, guess what? You can easily turn a physical garment into a photo, right? So lay the garment flat, get up on a chair or table if you have to, to take a picture straight down to get the whole garment in the photo, drop that thing into Illustrator, and then trace on top of it. That's not cheating. That's just using the tools and resources you have in front of you. Um, But yes, this is absolutely something that you have to know how to do. So, you know, finagle it however you need. Um, You don't, again, you don't have to start from scratch. Uh, Another website that I run in additional to successful fashion designer is templatesforfashion.com and you can grab a a base flat off of that for a dollar or two they're very very cost effective and use that as a starting point to modify Um, again don't use it as a cheat for an interview to show that you know how to sketch something that you didn't actually sketch but again you don't always have to be starting from zero um and turn it turn a real garment into a photo there you go there's your easiest solution so i hope that helps but yes absolutely an expected skill um in regards to loading a plaid pattern in a shirt with photoshop First of all, I wouldn't be doing it in Photoshop. Side note, um, a lot of brands and a lot of designers do this in Photoshop. And it's just, I really do this stuff in, in Illustrator. I have a bunch of tutorials out there on doing it in Illustrator. Um, Photoshop is just a lot less flexible when it comes to dropping patterns into garments. Um, you cannot, uh, it's just a lot less flexible. That said, if they wanted you to do it in Photoshop, then you do it in Photoshop. Or maybe you say, you know what? It's really great to do it in Illustrator because this reason, this reason, this reason, and tell them why it's better. Um, A lot of reasons. It's more flexible. You can change the colorways more easily. You can rotate, scale, um, adjust the directionality in Illustrator a lot more easily than you can in Photoshop. Additionally, it's a one-stop shop. You're working in Illustrator to draw your flats. You work in Illustrator to put the patterns in them. Um, All right. That aside, my Illustrator rant aside, if anyone out there has been following me for a long time. You guys know how I feel about Illustrator versus Photoshop for 98% of the work that we do in the fashion industry. That said, to get to your actual question, is it useful to know how to render the textures also? Um, Yeah, you know what? I do think that it is really useful. Um, It's not that complicated of a skill set. Again, I have plenty of tutorials out there on rendering repeating patterns, whether they're from scratch, uh, whether they're from scans, whether they are from photographs, how to kind of mock them up in in Illustrator, sometimes with the use of Photoshop, but then I always bring the pattern back into Illustrator. That being said, yeah, I do think that you need to know how to do this. Um, I do think it's it's kind of essential to understand how to create the basics. You know, if you're going after a company that works with a lot of plaids, then yeah, you need to know how to create plaid patterns in Illustrator. Again, I have a tutorial specifically on creating plaid. So check out my site for all of those. But um, yeah, these are skills, you know, again, depending on where you are in your career, even if you're upwards of senior level, I think it's still really important to have these skills. Uh, depending on the size of the company that you're working with, you may or may not have an assistant that does this. If you are coming in as an assistant or entry level, then oh boy, yes, you do have to have these skills because that's a lot of the work that you're going to be doing. So take a minute to learn how to work with patterns and repeats in Illustrator um, and and render some basic textures. Again, there's some learning curve behind it, but I do think it's a very important skill. And I also think that if the brand's asking you to do it in the interview, then that's your first sign that yes, it's an important skill. Uh, Again, depending on what the artwork is and what the texture is and what the end use is, dropping it into a t-shirt. If it's a photograph of a t-shirt and they're having you drop it in, then that yes, is something done in Photoshop. But if they're having having you drop it into a flat sketch in Photoshop. No, 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 no. I do not like that at all. Um, Again, done with the rant on that, but I hope that helps and uh, I hope the interview went well. Let me know how it panned out or what other opportunities you have come your way and uh, how those skills work out for you in the job hunt process. All right, last up, we have a question from Hannah. And Hannah writes, 
I basically did the opposite of you, where I went to school for textile and apparel, but found myself as a graphic designer as that had always been a hobby of mine. I have recently been missing the fashion world, but still love my design jobs. How do you think I should go about combining the two? Any suggestions or tips? So side note for those of you listening who don't know my backstory is that I went to school for graphic design and then wound up breaking into the fashion industry using my computer skills. And Hannah sounds like she did the opposite, but now she wants to get into fashion. So Hannah, I think you have a lot of options here because one, having computer skills in the fashion industry is a huge, huge, huge asset. And it is something that a lot of designers don't have having illustrator and Photoshop and in design, um, less important Photoshop and in design, even if brands say it on their their job listings, I often find it's HR writing those job posts, and they don't know or the manager that's writing them and they don't know and they just put all three. Or what often happens is the brands are using Photoshop for things they shouldn't be using Photoshop for. And that's why they put them in there. Um, Kind of not dissimilar to what we just talked about with Rosetta. That said, back to your question, how do you take your graphic design experience and your degree in textiles and apparel and get into fashion and combine the two? So I think you have a couple different options. I mean, one very simple option is to get a graphic design job at a fashion company. And so that could be, you know, depending on the size of the company, that could be working in their marketing department, and that could be doing things like catalogs and promotional materials and graphics for their website or emails or things like that. And so I think that's a really quick, easy fix to combine the two is look for those type of opportunities. If it's a smaller brand, they may not have a whole department for that. And so there could be some interesting crossover where you work on things like hang tags and labels and packaging and trims and and, and things like that, and perhaps also lookbooks and catalogs and, and editing photos from photo shoots, right? Like think about all of the skills within a fashion company that require graphic design skills, all the tasks that require graphic design skills. There's quite a few of them. And I know this because I wound up being responsible for a lot of them when the company I was working for went through a massive round of layoffs in the recession in 2008, and all the responsibilities from the graphic design team and the marketing team got dropped on the fashion team. And it turned into, we did everything from catalogs and photo shoot and photo retouching and hang tags. All We did the whole thing, the website, all of it. So I think there's so much crossover that you could play with there in terms of What are fashion brands that might have opportunities for you to do some graphic work? That also said, I think you can, you know, put together a portfolio of what type of fashion stuff interests you um, using your computer skills and using the skills you have from your degree and see if you can break into a more assistant or entry level position in the design department. I think that's probably going to be the harder route, to be totally honest. Um, I don't know where you are at in your career if going back to an entry level type of assistant job is going to be a huge step backwards. I don't know how much experience you have, but you know, know that can also be an option is um, kind of combining your interest in fashion plus your degree in fashion with your computer skills, putting together some self-directed projects and showing them what you have to offer. I don't know where you live. Again, that's going to take into consideration um, what your options may or may not be. But think about the ways you can combine your experience to present yourself as a really, really great candidate. Your easiest path of least resistance is probably going to be doing graphics within a fashion company. And then again, as I mentioned earlier, with the advice for Nancy, you know, get in based on the company, not based on the role. So get in doing graphics at a fashion company, and then it's a lot easier to kind of navigate your way around the company once you can get in there and start building relationships and and showing that you're really driven and you're an awesome employee and you can really easily create opportunities for yourself once you're inside the brand. So I hope that helps, Hannah. Um, that would be the direction I would go. And uh, on top of that, it wouldn't hurt, I don't think, to just start doing some fashion stuff on the side. Like, what are you really excited about? Um, are you? Do you want to start sketching some designs as flats? Do you do hand sketching? Uh, you know, what? what is it about the design and the fashion world that really excites you? Like, wh- wh- are you doing that at night while you're sitting in front of the computer or sitting in front of the TV? Are you sketching? Um, so I would also encourage you to just start doing some of that stuff that's almost like 
if you're that excited about it, it's like an extension of your being. You just do it. Um, you have that much interest and passion towards it that it just, you have to do it. So think about what you can be doing on the side just for fun to get some of that creative energy out that could transfer over into you having some body of work to just show them. Um, and it might not be to get that design role, might not be to get that role in the fashion department. It might be that, that you just show it to them in the graphics department. So it's like, yeah, I have all this experience in graphics. I can do all these things. I'm also really interested in fashion, which is kind of why I'd love to work for your company and makes me a great match for this type of role. Um, So I think you can kind of pitch it and angle it that way. Uh, A lot of great ways you can go about that. So I hope that helps, Hannah. Again, keep me updated. Let me know what what type of opportunities you find and how that goes. Thanks so much for listening, you guys. Again, this is a mailbag episode of the Successful Fashion Designer Podcast. If you want to get your questions answered, I do this show once a month, and you can send your questions about anything in the industry. Don't be afraid if it sounds like a silly or a stupid or a tiny question. No question is bad. And guess what? The first time I did this show, there were some really simple questions in there, and I got feedback from a lot of people that said, wow, I had that exact same question. Um, I totally got stuck on that. So, you know, if you have a question about something, chances are there's a lot of other people out there wondering the same exact thing. So don't be shy. Send your questions to podcast at soheidi.com. That's S-E-W-H-E-I-D-I.com. Thank you so much for listening. I really appreciate each and every one of you. If you guys love this show, if you you listen to this show and you just think, gosh, there's so much great information here, um, which I know a lot of you do because the the reviews on iTunes are just phenomenal. Thank you guys so much for leaving all of those. But here's the thing. There are so many other people out there that are dying to get this information and this knowledge, and it is by you telling other people about this show that the word spreads. So if you know someone in the industry who you think would be interested in this because they work in fashion or they want to get into fashion, please do me a favor and share this podcast with them. It really means a lot to me, and I'm sure it would mean a lot to them. For links on any of the references I mentioned in this episode, visit the show notes at sfdnetwork.com slash 56 or just scroll down on your phone or wherever you're listening and check out the show notes below the episode. Thanks so much for listening, you guys. I'll talk to you in the next episode of the Successful Fashion Designer Podcast.